from Studio B in the Communication Building at Olivet Nazarene University. It's tonight at Olivet with Jack White. Tonight's guests include Dr. Steve Case and members from the Flat Earth Club. Here's your host, Jack White. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm your host, Jack White. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's get into some news. A man is raising money to build a statue of the first cat in space, which seems to be an important enough feat to warrant a statue. So far, the campaign has raised $38,000, and I was on board until I did some research into this cat. He was only in space for like five minutes. No wonder everyone moved on and forgot about this cat. I'm pretty sure me and a few friends could get a cat into orbit for five minutes for that 38 grand. <laughs> then we wouldn't need a statue because this cat wouldn't even be special anymore. <laughs> a loud overhead boom took hundreds of people by surprise accidentally in Alabama. Authorities, as well as NASA, had a hard time determining the source of the noise in the sky. Based only on my experience, which is limited, I think they should consider the possibility of it just being thunder. <laughs> Uh, a planet has been discovered that is about the same size as Earth and could even sustain life. The best news is that it'll be Earth's closest neighbor pretty soon, uh, in 79,000 years to be exact. If this planet's as flat as Earth, too, maybe we'll be able to walk straight onto it when the planet gets close enough. <laughs> a recent study has shown that sheep are able to recognize the faces of different celebrities and were able to identify the same face upwards of 10 different times and learn whether or not it was safe to take food from which celebrity. The most important finding of the study was that sheep are as creeped out by John Waters as humans are. <laughs> a pilot and inventor has set the world record for the fastest travel in a flight suit. With two engines on each arm and two engines on his lower back, the pilot was able to reach a whopping 32 miles per hour. Is that a typo? <laughs> okay, no. Once again, I've got to say I'm not impressed. Give me and my pals some of that cat statue money, and we could have somebody in the air for a lot longer, going a lot faster than 32 miles an hour. <laughs> we have a great show for you tonight. The Flat Earth Society is here. <laughs> and later, Dr. Stephen Case will join us. You don't want to miss it. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. Did you know parking over tall, dry grass can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back to the show. You know, as the semester comes down to an end, I find myself at a loss for words. You know what I mean? It's like not being able to find the right words. Uh, if, if only there was a convenient way to help me solve this convoluted puzzle. Uh, actually, let's try Mad Libs. That would probably work pretty well. Uh, I don't have time. Uh, could we send a crew member? Uh, we need the camera people. We need that camera, especially. He's got my best angle. Um, you're important, important. We're mic'd already. Could we send the sound guy? Sound guy? Yeah? All right. Send him. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with Jessica, Michael Wooten, Alex Kempton, Abby Olcott, Tyrell Lafridge, Ann Brown, Jacob Woodard, Charles Kerrigan, Hudson Whitaker. Give us a name of your friend. Barrick. Something you eat with. A fork. Something you cook with. A utensil. A number. 42. Another number. 105. A unit of measurement. Meter. Something that burrows underground. A mole. Something large. A whale. In action. Squatting. A gymnastic move. A backflip. A number. 42. Something you find in the garden. Um, wood chips. Something you write in. A textbook. Last year, my friend Barrick and I decided to dig a really deep hole. We got a fork and a utensil, 
and used them to start digging. We had been digging for 42 minutes and the hole was 105 meters deep. That ain't bad. Uh, we couldn't see the top anymore, it was so deep. Perhaps if we carried on digging, we'd get to the center of the earth. If you got to 105 in 42 minutes, I wager you can. Suddenly, a mole the size of a whale wriggled out of the soil next to us and started to squat. Uh, we were so shocked that we stopped digging. Uh, then without warning, it did a backflip twice in a row and wriggled back into the hole it had come out of. Um, we carried on digging for another 42 minutes, which if we're staying consistent with the last of a dig for 42 minutes, they'll be at 210 meters. Uh, stopped to eat our packed lunches of wood chip sandwiches and then carried on again after a while. We got tired and made a ladder out of the textbooks we brought with us and climbed right back to the top. That was not a bad story. Uh, can we get sound guy to go do that again? Can you give me an action? Swimming. Give us a color. Green. An item of clothing. Socks. Choose the weather. Stormy. An animal. Octopus. Give us a number. Two. Another, a number? 42. A uh, color. Magenta. A sea creature. Um... Squid. And a greeting. Hola. A body part. Left pinky. Something that you would eat. Veggie burger. A color. Puce. A temperature. 72. Another number. Um, 57. Uh, a country of your choice. Bosnia. And a vehicle. Mm, SUV. Uh, this one will be about oceans. <clears throat> Last year at the beach, I decided to see how far I could swim. I swam into the sea wearing just my green sock. Uh, the sea was 72 degrees, but I didn't mind. I started swimming. I did the octopus stroke for almost 42 miles, back to 42. I saw magenta squids swimming towards me. I wasn't scared, and when I got closer, I said, Ola, would you like a lift? Switching, switching languages there. Uh, of course, I said yes, and, it got, and I got on its back held onto its left pinky, I don't know if they have those, and we started swimming. We passed a veggie burger-shaped island, I don't know if that would be different than just a burger-shaped island, and a puce boat. The weather was stormy, perfect for a swim with a squid. <laughs> after we felt like 57, after what felt like 57 minutes, the squid arrived at the destination. It had taken me to uh, Bosnia, <laughs> Uh, but all that swimming had made me tired, so I caught an SUV back home. Great job. Wow. Two stellar stories. Very impressed. My first guests tonight believe that the Earth is as flat as a pancake. Welcome the representatives of the Flat Earth Society, Andy Artema and John Zielinski. guys for being here. Um, so the two of you are representatives for the Flat Earth Society. What exactly is that? The Flat Earth Society is based off of this concept of zertitism, the belief that one should believe what one sees. We see that the Earth is flat, therefore it must be flat. And a lot of people um, ask what the Flat Earth model looks like, and um, we would, in layman's terms, sure, um, as I am. geocentric, uh, as in the center of the universe, everything revolves around the Earth. Um, the Earth is flat and <laughs> is covered by a dome. And at the outer edge of this disk is an ice wall, which is guarded by the government. I've never actually seen the ice wall, Has anyone? but I've had some friends that have, and when they got close, they were held up at gunpoint and turn, told to turn around. All right. Um, so how did the Flat Earth Society come to Olivet? Um, last year, we had a group of guys who came and spread awareness through handing out flyers in the quad. And uh, this year, uh, Andy and I also did the same and set up a table in Ludwig and spread awareness there. OK. Uh, so. We're in the second year of Olivet's Flat Earth Society. What are you hoping to accomplish with this thing? Um, with the Flat Earth Society, uh, 
we hope to start a new chapter here and uh, here at Olivet um, for that. Um, we've gained a lot of traction, a lot of interest from the table in Ludwig, and um, our hope is to break the system of indoctrination and oppression that um, we face of the globe. Um, of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of the belief system of the globe. In, in that we were, you know, since like maybe the second grade, yeah, I think taught I that, about it yeah, young. me too, but um, that the earth is a globe and we're just trying to break that system of oppression. So do the two of you buy into the earth being a flat kind of thing? Well, I've studied this stuff for four years. One of my majors here at Olivet is geological engineering. And after four years, I can tell you the government's lying to you. The earth is flat. Um, okay. One of, <laughs> you see these globe worshipers get their worldview not based off of scientific methodology, but based off of revealed truths of the government. You know, it seems a little suspicious to me that the United Nations flag is exactly the same as the flat earth map. I could see where that may raise a red flag. Um, so, I have a question, if, if, you may, if, if I may. So if the Earth's flat, I know that we can mine. How, how thick is the flat Earth? Good question. Um, what I would say to that is a couple years ago, the, there was a big uproar when some people wanted to drill into what they call the mantle. And yes. there was a huge uproar, definitely caused by the government. <laughs> they definitely did not want to know, want people to know that when you drill into the mantle, you fall through the earth. It's just nothing. So they caused a big uproar to stop this from happening. Okay. Uh, do you have any kind of proof for us? Yeah, there's a lot of proof. A lot of it gets into some complex scientific experiments, definitions. But here's one for you. Um, it's in. The Bible and in the Quran both say that the earth is flat. Um, I mean, two religions can't be wrong, right? Where in the Bible? Do in we the think Bible, it says, it says that? in Re Revelations, it says that angels stood on the four corners of the earth. I mean, how can there be four corners of the earth if the earth is round, right? Right. <laughs> and that's in the, the Bible? Yes. I mean, it, the government lied to us before. They were calling Pluto a planet, now all of a sudden it's not. You just can't change your mind about that. Wow. Okay, was Pluto flat as well? I mean, who knows? I mean, they've lied so many times to us in the past. Okay. Uh, how many? How many are on board with this uh, society here? Because I think you you've added a member here today. I mean, we have thousands of members all across the globe. At all of that specifically? How many? A couple here. A couple. Here. A couple. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for enlightening our prehistoric minds, and thank you for being here. Uh, when we come back, we'll be joined by Dr. Stephen Case. You don't want to miss it. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Welcome back to the show. My next guest is known around campus as the director of the Strickler Planetarium. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Case. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so you are not the only Stephen Case on campus. I am not. There's also a student Stephen Case. Uh, there is. is there a lot of confusion when people are trying to contact the two of you? Does that yes. happen often? Yes. Yes. Uh, quite a bit, um, and uh, he gets my emails, I get his emails, and we send them back and forth, nice. and eventually things get sorted out. Yeah, good. Uh, so the 
have the two of you like run into each other or know, know each other at all? Yeah, actually, he's uh, been in my classes for a couple semesters. Oh, no kidding. So. Wow. Uh, well, uh, let's get in a little to uh, what you do here on campus other than share a name. Um, so you have a lot of titles, but one of them is the director of the Strickler Planetarium. What all does that entail for you? Uh, well, the Planetarium is one of Olivet's primary um, educational outreach tools to the community. So uh, we are the only planetarium in the really greater Kankakee area, so between Chicago and Champaign, um, it's, it's us. Hmm. And uh, we do a lot of, uh, like I said, educational outreach. We do planetarium shows for students, for classes. We have uh, area school kids that have been coming to the planetarium for uh, the past 50 years now. Wow. And uh, we try to, uh, to uh, promote scientific literacy and, uh, and explain about the actual shape of the Earth. Well, <laughs> so you're not a, not a flat Earther? I, no, I, I, no, the Earth is not flat. All right, all right, interesting. Um, so you have been on board for how long? I've been here about 10 years in the okay. position of director. And uh, the planetarium is reaching its 50th year in We're operation? We're celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Wow. Yeah. Can you give us kind of a, a rundown of what the last 50 years have been like? Sure. Well, I haven't been here the whole time. Sure. But uh, the planetarium was uh, was built at about the same time as Reed Hall of Science was okay. in 1967. So I think we've got some photos of, of the construction. Um, that's right at the height of the space race. Okay. So about 10 years before that, Sputnik has been launched by the Soviets. And sure. so the United States is sort of trying to catch up. Um, in 1967, we haven't put a man on the moon yet. So we're sort of in the midst of that. And uh, yeah, so there was a, the president, uh, Harold Reed, president of Olivet, really mm -hmm. felt like we needed a new science building on campus. At the time, um, you know, the, all of the science, sciences were sort of scattered all over campus. I think uh, chemistry was like in the physical plant building, physics was over the gym, and so one building to bring them all together. And as part of that, he wanted to have a planetarium facility. Okay, uh, so in your 10 years, so a fifth of its whole life, uh, what has been some of the best experiences that you've had? Uh, well, when I first came, uh, we were in the midst of the first major uh, renovation in the planetarium's history. So okay. we went in the planetarium field, this was a big deal, going from the old sort of optomechanical projection system, which is sort of, if, you're, if you've ever been in an older planetarium, like the big projector at the center of the dome yeah. with dozens of slide projectors mm -hmm. around that. So we've gone digital. So we have a digital projection system now, and that's just really revolutionized the sort of things that we can do in the planetarium. Uh, but for me, my favorite part still is just the, uh, the evident awe that you get from kids when they see the stars for the first time yeah. in the planetarium. Uh, so 50 years is a big landmark. Do we have any sort of events coming up to commemorate it? Yeah, we're trying to do a series of uh, sort of things throughout the year. We had a big uh, reunion at Homecoming celebrating our 50th anniversary just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we designed 50th anniversary t-shirts that we're calling uh, the most comfortable t-shirts in the universe. And we're selling those at the planetarium. Mm. Um, we have uh, a new version of our Christmas show that we're premiering uh, actually this coming month in December. Okay. And um, yeah, sort of a, other events um, as the year unfolds. Will the Christmas show be open to all of that students? It will. So we do public shows usually the first and third weekend of every month. So usually the oh. first and third Saturday. Okay. And we have shows at 6 and 7.30. And then we always have a 9 o'clock show that's free and open to, uh, to anyone in the Olivet community. Wow. Okay. Uh, also, another thing that's coming up that some of us might be curious to go to is Olivet students. Uh, Big Bird's Adventure? <laughs> yeah, so we have planetarium shows for kids of all ages, okay. but uh, Big Bird's Adventure is one of our preschool-aimed shows, and I believe that's our public show for the month of, is it coming up in January? I don't know. I don't, sure. It's coming up soon, okay. but yeah, that's open to, plan, to uh, Olivet students as well, yeah. So Big Bird and Elmo don't will be uh, will be at the planetarium. Yeah, they'll be actually there. They w well, they will they will be there on the dome of the planetarium. Yes. That's good enough. <laughs> uh, so outside of working at the planetarium, uh, you teach physics and you teach astronomy here on campus. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Uh, well, it's a lot of fun. Um, I teach astronomy as a gen ed uh, uh, science requirement. So it's a, it's a way to uh, to learn more about our universe, to learn more about our place in the universe and really how we've come to understand uh, humanity's place on a spherical globe going around the sun in a very big universe. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I enjoy it quite a bit. I enjoy teaching astronomy, teaching science to um, really non-science majors. We get everyone in that class. Yeah. Uh, which one do you enjoy more of the two? Of astronomy or physics? Yeah. I, I, I would say it varies from semester to semester. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, great. Uh, we have to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere because when we come back, Dr. Case 
will be conducting a few science experiments here in the studio. Anxious that it's spring and your fingers still bare? Do you spend most of your time watching couples propose to each other on campus? Have you been attending multiple nights of speed dating, only to find that after you've mingled, you're still single? Yes, okay. Worry no more. Did you know that according to Pew Research Social and Demographic Trends, the majority of young Americans today are not rushing to the altar? Wait, so it's okay for me not to be engaged? What's the rush? Don't make the ring a fling. Every day, artists lose their earnings to internet pirates. 2.7 billion in worker earnings is lost every year. Don't be that guy. Support artists. Don't pirate music. Welcome back to the show. We're back with Dr. Case for a segment we like to call the testing lab. Uh, Dr. Case, I'm seeing batteries, wire. Tell us what we've got here. All right, so we've got a couple demonstrations that uh, I'll use in my physics class when we're talking about electromagnetism. Okay. So moving charges and magnetic fields and some of the interesting things you can do with them. So what we have here is we have some uh, fairly strong uh, rare earth magnets. Okay. So kind of hard to pull apart, but basically you've got a small stack of magnets here. I can't do it. Yeah, I know. Okay. Tough, right? All right, yeah. yeah. And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, attach these to the bottom of uh, our batteries. So okay. we've just got a regular, uh, this is a D battery. You can take one of those double A batteries. All right. And uh, oh. over here we have some um, copper wire that we've just sort of put into an interesting shape here. Yeah. Now it's important to emphasize copper is not magnetic. So they're, the magnets aren't going to attract the copper okay. uh, at all. And that's actually going to be important for the next demonstration, too. Okay. So copper is not magnetic, but it can conduct uh, electric charges very well. Got it. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a circuit where we're going to have a uh, charge coming out of one end of the battery, going through the coil of wire, and then down through the magnets and back into the battery. So basically just a simple circuit. Okay. But when you have a moving charge, so we're going to have charge moving through this copper. When you have a moving charge in a magnetic field yeah. generated by these magnets, um, that exerts a force. And what we're going to see is an interesting effect here. So I like to call these perpetual motion machines, okay. although they're not. Um, they'll eventually stop moving when the battery dies. When the battery dies. Oh! Look at that. Is it mine also? I yeah. Assume? Give it a shot. It started moving even a little bit faster as long as there we go. Wow. Oh so God, you've got quick. the charges going, conducting uh, through the circuit. And uh, again, as they're moving through the coil, through a magnetic field, you get a, a nice, healthy little, uh, that. little force that's exerted on that. I can hear that. It's going so fast. So you basically made an electromagnetic engine. Wow. A little dynamo. And it'll go, uh, it'll keep spinning until the battery is drained. I think mine's getting there because this is there you go. much slower than yours. Holy cow. This is incredible. All right. All right. What else do you have? For? Okay. Well, I've got um, actually more fun with uh, with magnets and copper. So again, Great. here same sort of thing. We have a, a copper um, hollow copper tube. Okay. And we have two of the same sort of magnets, except these magnets are round. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to basically do the same principle here. Now, instead of uh, having a battery generate a magnetic charge, uh, I'm sorry, an electric charge. Yeah. We're going to drop a magnet through here, and as a magnetic field passes through the copper, a changing magnetic field creates uh, an electric current. Okay. So copper is not magnetic. Again, there's no, um, you know, it's not attracted not to the magnet at all. Okay. But as, a magnet, as the magnet falls through the copper, it's going to create a, an electric charge. A moving current is going to create a magnetic field that's going to oppose the motion of the magnet. And we're going to see what's happened. Okay. What happened. So we're going to call this uh, sort of an anti-gravity demonstrator. All right. So what we're going to do is we're, you're going to drop it through the coil, and I'm just going to take the same sort of magnet and drop it at the same time. Okay. And we're going to see how they fall. Three, right. two, one, drop. It's not out. <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Here, try it again. Okay. Watch it as it falls down. So basically, it's going to levitate slowly down the tube. Okay. Wow. It is. And there you have it. Anti-gravity. That's incredible. And our perpetual motion machines are still moving. Oh, yours They're is actually still going. going quite fast. There you go. Holy cow. Will this hurt to touch? So is that I don't know. Bike? Try it. Find it out. The wire might be a little bit warm. No. 
So. Oh, it is, so, it is warm, actually. Fun with magnets. Wow. That's incredible. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Case, for Thanks being for here. Thanks for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Case, for stopping by. And thank you for tuning in. Have a great evening and good night from all of us.